Well, thanks for finding the time to talk to us, Daniel. Um, for those not familiar with this director's work, could you tell us a little about Valerian Borovcik and what makes his work so unique and important? Borovcik was born in Poland in the early 1920s. Uh, he established himself principally as a poster designer and later graphic artist. During the late 1950s, he collaborated with another poster artist, Jan Lenitsa, on a series of short films. This brought him to the attention of an international audience, and he moved to France, where he kind of became one of the world's greatest animators during the early 1960s. Towards the end of the 1960s, he moved into live action feature films. And then, in a move that surprised many people during the early 1970s, he started to become associated with uh, what many people regarded as erotic films. And initially, these films were seen as kind of taboo busting and uh, artistic and challenging. But by the end of the 1970s, many of the critics who'd previously supported him started to um, question uh, his integrity. And during the 1980s, uh, his kind of career w went into decline, and he kind of died pretty much in obscurity. Uh, in 2006. Um, could you perhaps tell us a little about the influence of his work on other filmmakers? This is, I mean, this is a very interesting thing because his films, particularly the early films, the short French films, and also the early feature films like Go to Island of Love and Blanche were incredibly influential, particularly in England, um, for example there was a group of artists associated with St. Martin's College of Art, uh, Craigie Horsfield, uh, Andrzej Klimowski, and John Goto, the photographer, who all saw Borovcik as a kind of a way to jump from fine art into film. And in the Royal College of Art, there were the Quay brothers, who similarly were kind of very much interested in Borovcik's animation, particularly his early feature, Goto Island of Love. There were writers, Angela Carter, who was particularly interested in Go to Island of Love, and uh, Neil Jordan cited The Beast as a particular influence on The Company of Wolves. Terry Gilliam was particularly keen on uh, Borovcik's early animations. And uh, I don't, I think it, it, it's too, it's way too strong to say that they were the primary influence on Gilliam's Monty Python animation. Stan Vanderbeek is equally important, I feel, uh, but it was an influence. So uh, Borovcik's influence is by proxy, by people who are perhaps a lot more familiar to audiences, like the Monty Python animations. Uh, but he himself is, was well, very well known in the 1960s amongst kind of film clubs and art house circles, is perhaps less well known. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the upcoming short films collection that you're working on? Yes, uh, last year, um, together with Arrow Films, we came to an agreement with Borovcik's widow, Lydia, and this involved transferring uh, nine short films and two early feature films, the feature-length uh, animation, Mr and Mrs Cabal, and his second live-action feature, Blanche. Uh, so we transferred them, and they were restored by James White at Deluxe, and this is the first time Blanche got a VHS release. The shorts have never had an official VHS release, as well as Mr. Cabal. So this is the first time, really, these films have been brought into the, the digital age. Uh, since then, we've done a Kickstarter campaign to restore Borovcik's live-action debut, Go to Island of Love, and we hope to restore the five remaining short films. So this, this kind of package uh, really um, counts as the bedrock of Borovcik's kind of artistic work. And uh, it's very exciting because it's like, it's not often you find a filmmaker who uh, was once ranked alongside Fellini and Eisenstein being totally forgotten about. So, you know, we're always hearing about uh, uh, lost masterpieces, but these, these really are lost masterpieces. <laughs> Um, as consumers, we only tend to see the finished results of an endeavour like this. Um, given that these films are rarely seen, and I presume not in pristine condition, some of them, could you just briefly talk about the challenges you faced in bringing this collection together? And, and I mean, it, it's interesting because uh, I, I 
mounted a kind of a, a Borovchik retrospective at the Lux Center in 2001. And initially, Borovchik agreed to come across to London to present the films. Uh, and then he, then he kind of declined. And the reason was, he said, look, I can't stand in front of a screen and introduce old 60mm prints of my films. This is not how he intended them to be seen. And if you can't find a way to actually make new prints, to make them correspond to how I imagined, I, I can't go because those aren't my films. So for many years, it, it wasn't even possible to screen Borovchik's films from archival prints because his widow, after he died, just blocked all the screenings. And the only possibility to see them was by restoring them. And in the case of Borovchik's films, most of the negatives and the materials were stored in uh, French laboratories. Uh, during the last few years, several of them have started to go bankrupt and the materials have been transferred to um, the French National Film Archive. So it involved a... Uh, after the initial agreement with uh, Ligia Borovchik, it then involved uh, persuading the French National Film Archive to let them transfer their materials to London so they could be restored. And, of course, this is Arrow Films. It's, 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 a, it's a commercial enterprise, so although these are very worthy films and they're great films, that has to be balanced with commercial consideration. So it's a very fine balancing act because, you know, it would be great to pull out all the stops and do kind of, you know, uh, 4K digital restoration. Um, so it's a case of kind of finding a balance. I mean, what, what, what's going to hold up on a cinema screen and look great? And the decision was to scan it 2K and restore to high definition. And having seen these films projected from DCP at a festival I programmed in Poland in July, uh, I think we're all staggered by the results. Now, I gather from our correspondence that there are going to be some extra features on this disc set. Um, once again, we as consumers see an interview or a short film included on a disc and we rarely give a thought to the process of actually making that happen. Has that been a challenge as well? Um, not really, and it's for a simple reason. I mean, my, my feeling about extra features is, first and foremost, as a consumer, the first question I ask when producing a disc is, what would I like to see on there? Usually it's cast and crew. Uh, in this case, the director's not around, so the, the first challenge was finding archival material of Borovchik talking about his films. Um, that we've done. And secondly, it was a case of actually finding cast and crew. Uh, now, I know many of these people for in excess of 10 years, in some cases 15 years, I'd built up a relationship with them, so it was very easy to get them to talk about their films um, in French. So there are practical things like translation and subtitling costs, which is, has to be factored into the things. Uh, I've, my feeling is I'll always go with uh, quality rather than quantity, so my approach towards these releases is rather than provide hours and hours and hours of material, just kind of uh, smaller focused featurettes for each of the discs, uh, bringing together different people's perspectives, telling the story of making these individual films and giving some sort of impression about who Borovchik was and showing him at work and showing footage shot on set uh, of Borovchik at work. I think that's very important and bringing together high quality visual material um, which has been scanned from various archives in Poland. Uh, also Borovchik's personal archive. I was privileged when uh, uh, his house was being cleaned out and the archive was being deposited in the Cinematheque Francaise and the artwork was being de deposited in the uh, collection of Borovchik's artwork at the Annecy Museum to uh, help to catalogue it. So I had a, and some kind of uh, privilege to actually see what was in his collection and I've been able to use that to kind of actually uh, supplement both the featurettes and also the booklet. So, uh, you know, for me it's, it's, it's a great way of synthesizing all facets of Borovchik's career. And I, I really think that I don't have to sell Borovchik anymore. Usually you have to fight and say why you think he's great and why he's not a soft pornographer. But in this case, I think the work really speaks for itself, itself the films, and secondly, the collaborators and the supplementary features will all really put forward, I think, a, uh, an unbreakable case why Borovchik is one of the greats. It's as simple as that. How long was this project taken in total? The, the project with Arrow, uh, really, we started to discuss this 
about this time last year and uh, to really I mean usually these are protracted kind of negotiations uh, Arrow I, I, I was shocked that made a decision straight away and uh, it made such a change and their conviction has been unwavering throughout the project in terms of my interest in Borovchik, uh, I've been working programming retrospectives, trying to get prints made, writing about him and interviewing his colleagues for 15 years. Uh, I first saw Borovchik's films at um, a film theatre in Stoke-on-Trent uh, 20 years ago uh, when I was uh, yeah, a teenager. So uh, this for me, it's, um, it's a great... Uh, Payoff, let's say, all, all of this, uh, and, and it's great to think that I've managed to get so many people on camera when they were still around, because there's nothing better, I feel, than getting things from the horse's mouth. And uh, some of those people, like Bernard Parmigiani, the composer who worked with Borovchik on many of his short films and his feature film, um, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Miss Osborne, I mean, he, you know, he died a few months ago, and, but luckily, you know, five years ago, when I, this project didn't exist, it was able to actually get an interview on camera. I think it's really important to get these people when you can, particularly now with DVD extras, because in a few years, these type of films, it's going to be impossible to actually um, find people because of old age. Sure. So when will we get to see the results? We know our uh, releasing a disc set, but uh, are they going to be screened in cinemas as well? The, the plan is, is that in May, a retrospective uh, in collaboration with BFI South Bank, which is where we are now, uh, the Institute of Contemporary Arts, and the Kinoteca Polish Film Festival, uh, those three institutions are putting on a retrospective of Borowczyk's films uh, y using these uh, res restorations as the kind of uh, the basis for what's been screened. So they will all be pristine editions. There'll also be an exhibition of his artwork at the Institute of Contemporary Arts. And, uh, and then this will actually, the kind of the culmination of all these events will be the box set, which I'm working on with Arrow, which will have um, five Blu-rays and seven DVDs and it'll have a booklet and uh, it'll have all these features so we're aiming to get that late May early June uh, we haven't got a concrete date yet a lot of that really hinges on uh, the transportation of materials from France for example after the Kickstarter campaign for Goto finished in June we actually made 26,000 pounds the target was 20,000 pounds all that extra money is going to be ploughed into further restoration work and that is going to be the five Argos shorts. At the moment, and I've just come from Paris, and one of the reasons I was there was to actually kind of get the materials and speed it up to London. We don't know how much it's going to cost until we see the condition, how much work is required. Uh, so, you know, really if it means kind of, you know, holding out a few extra weeks uh, to, just to make sure everything's perfect, that'll be the case, but I don't know a kind of exact date yet as to when it will be released, but the target is end of May. And finally, are, are there any other projects that you'd like to see get off the ground, you know, to, relating to this? I mean, there are so many filmmakers and so many films. I mean, I would like to see the, the second half of Brofchik's career, I'd like to see a uh, uh, a second box set of volume two, but I mean there are certain logistical problems, mainly rights. I think it, it's very easy to kind of dream up of a box set, but the, the simplicity with this box set is that the rights are really split between two people. Uh, in the case of, say, for example, a volume two, we would look at every film. It means negotiations with a different rights holder, so uh, it's logistically very difficult. Um, yeah, but I, I would like to see a lot more Russian titles, a lot of uh, titles specific, specifically from the Caucasus, Georgian films, films by Tengiz Abeladze, particularly Repentance is a film I'm really interested in which hasn't got a DVD release in the UK. Uh, I would like to see films by Larissa Shepitka, which two of which have came out on the Criterion Collection, but um, I'd like to see the rest of her films. I'd like to see more of Alan Klimov's films. Uh, we all know him for kind of Come and See, but uh, he made some very interesting films, particularly comedies, which I think need a, a kind of uh, a proper release. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's easy to dream, but uh, you know, uh, th those would be my choices, but whether those uh, will ever come to fruition, I don't know. Well, thanks very much for speaking to us. And, uh, Thank you very much. Okay.